Hi everyone, so it's Monday, it is September, so it's getting gloomy, it's getting darker quicker, it's getting, takes a little bit longer to lighten up in the mornings, and we've already faced the first challenges of the day, we've just been over to uh, do an installation of a valent heat pump, the pad that's been laid out by the building contractor isn't quite the right size, so they've got to rejig it, we need to get a buffer up into the loft hatch, the loft was slightly too small, so we've had to make a few amendments to get the buffer up into the, uh, up into the loft space space and also we've got a new apprentice starting this week Adam yeah. so uh, he's well up for the challenge we've got quite a lot to do today so we're gonna show you a few things that we have to get up to for our commissioning process and everything else that comes with it on a new build project over in Croydon which is a south build a new build over in the Croydon area and unfortunately for the guys that are building this property and it's still unfinished at the moment we've had to overcome quite a few situations in order to make sure that this system and the uh, all of the pipe work was in place in order to be able to install this heat pump now sometimes you go into a property and everything's in line and everything's exactly where it should be or if you're or if we're involved with the south build in the early stages we can make sure that the everything is kind of done before it needs to be done if that makes sense so for example you know we would if there's a plumbing company working on the property putting all of the um, cold and hot water feeds, the flow and returns across to either radiator systems or underfloor heating systems. You know, we're very specific about the amount of pipe work that needs to be in place and what sort of pipe size in would be best placed for it, depending on distances and what it's serving, for example. Now, when the guys have employed their contractors here at the time, the plumbing company hadn't experienced working with air source heat pumps or anything at all. But the other problem was, and what we'd soon found out, was that you know they put in a cold water supply to enter where the cylinder was going. Now these are an unvented, pressurised hot water cylinder, okay? So minimum pipe sizing really should be 22 mil to feed um, the, the, the combi valve, as we call it, to serve the hot water, so to fill the cylinder. Now this generally is minimum across the board, like you, know, you should always really be thinking about putting 22 in as a minimum. One, because of flow rates. Okay, so you can have pressure in a system, you could have three bar of pressure in an eight mil pipe, but you're only gonna get so much water capacity inside of that pipe, okay? So, you know, if you imagine that if you've got three bar going through eight mil pipe, it's gonna come through, but the flow rate's gonna be rubbish. And as you start to open up different outlets so different taps for example it starts to pull some of that flow rate away from it so then it starts to reduce even further um, and then for 15 mil but if you've got say a 22 mil or 28 mil pipe it's full it's got a larger capacity of water internally to it so that means your flow rates are going to be far far better so you know you could be an 8 mil pipe and you could have a flow rate of say 8 or 9 liters per minute up that to 22 mil, and then you should be looking at 16, 17, or 18 litres per minute, depending on how the how the main um, is set up coming into the property. So, but you can get all this information prior to obviously building your house and, and implementing all of your hot and cold water feeds from the water board. The water board will go to the meter and they'll say, well, you know, you've got five bar pressure and 20 litres per minute, for example. So we just need to make sure, and we always, you know, pre-check these before we would, you know, come into the property and start to put in a cylinder. But we come to this one pretty late. And the reason being is that the building contractor was kind of out of his depths a little bit when it comes to, you know, what to implement internally. So, you know, we kind of had to pick this up a bit late in the project. And with that in mind, they only had a 15 mil supply for the cold water. So, you know, it, straight away we said well you know you're, you're going to run into a few issues here by the time you get to your furthest bathroom there's three bathrooms here and um, you're going to really experience some issues when it comes to your flow rates so we've updated all of that we've put in the right size pipe work for this um 
we've implemented all that we could do with, with regards to this cylinder. Now this is a Mitsubishi pre-plumb cylinder, so this means that we can get things in a slightly tighter space because lots of the ancillaries and the controls and the, and the FTC, which is the main controller or the brains of the operation, are already attached to the cylinder, so we don't have to use up extra wall space in order to do that. We do on some installations because we're using a third party cylinder, meaning that we're not using one of Mitsu's very own. So another few things that we had to deal with and what was very apparent to us was the underfloor heating system. So they've put an underfloor heating system in on the ground floor. We've installed one on the first floor, but they were trying to um, you know, tell the client, well, you, ne you, know, you need to put electric radiators upstairs. And we said, well, that's just crazy. Why would you have an air source heat pump serving you downstairs and then just having electric radiators upstairs? I mean, it's gonna cost a fortune to run. Um, it's really not best practice. So, you know, we looked at other alternatives and eventually we came to the conclusion that the underfloor heating system upstairs would serve better, both for efficiency and also for the heat distribution as well. Every square inch of the floor is reducing heat and therefore you can run your flow temperatures very low on the heat pump. You know, we'll be setting this to around about 40 degrees and I think we could probably achieve in a new build situation about 38 degree flow rate which means the coefficient of performance will be far higher. So again, they were just, um, they hadn't really thought about thermostats and they'd ordered parts for the ground floor and they ended up giving them wired thermostats. But to no one, not none of the electricians, all the walls were finished, plastered, and they hadn't put in a three core nerf to serve these thermostats. So again, we've had to change the system and give them wireless thermostats in order to give them a, an opportunity to zone each room and, and without having to rip apart walls and add wires in. They're all solid walls, so it's not always the easiest thing to have to implement after the fact. Um, we've got a supply for the power coming off of this subboard. So we've got a consumer unit dedicated in here. So that just supplies for the immersion here. So it's got a separate um, cir circuit breaker, 16 amps to supply the control uh, for the immersion in this. We've also got a 32 amp supply for our outdoor unit, which is the Mitsubishi Ikidam. And uh, we're going to have a quick look at that, shall we? So we've looked at the cylinder internally. Now we're going to look at the heat pump and you know what we have to think about when it comes to location, siting of that outdoor unit. And we also, you know, sometimes it's difficult. You know, you might only have one specific area. Lots of new build properties that we see have a tremendous amount of glazing in. So that means they've got massive bifold doors, etc. So, you know, in order to place a heat pump, you have to really think about where it's going to be situated. And because this was already built and all the walls were complete already, so we had to think about our location for the heat pump, how we can suitably put in what we call the primaries. So they're the flow and return pipe work going to the cylinder, which serve the hot water and heating system. And, you know, just making sure that one, it sits somewhere that's not gonna to interfere too much with say outdoor living, or that it's not gonna interfere or be in the way of a window or something where they could see it sitting in the living room or the dining room or something like that. Uh, fortunately, the cylinder is just the other side of this wall on the ground floor. So this was pretty straightforward. Um, but again, you know, I'd say to any self builder, if you're considering what you need to do and you know we'll touch on this in other videos but it's to really think about placement of the heat pump placement of the cylinder what needs to be in place before you start shutting off walls for example signal cables uh, power to the unit itself so we've got our rotary isolator out here which has to power this outdoor unit has to be external and has to be within um, you know, kind of touching distance of the heat pump so that it allows you to isolate if you need to do any work on the heat pump itself. Um, there are signal cables, as I've said, between um, the interface that sits internally to talk to the unit outside um, and also, you know, running the primary. So, you know, you want to be running this pipe work and often the case will be that this will be 28 mil pipe. Um, we always like to be able to install this where we can in copper and it has to be insulated throughout so that it minimizes any heat loss involved with it at all. The reason why we want to do it in copper is because it helps with the flow rates and you know the velocity of the water going to and from point A to point B um, and longevity as well. So you know if we've got a continuous running copper, it's 
you would expect that to last the lifetime of the property unless someone's you know put in a, a screw through the wall or or there's a situation where um, you know the pipework may have been soldered but it's not been very well done and, and later on it can corrode but we don't expect these situations in a new build situation and um, this is 11.2 so it's 11.2 kilowatt output from this heat pump which will serve 100% of the heating and hot water demand for this property um, and you know like I say that there's always elements to which you know you really need to consider you know you want a solid flat surface for the heat pump to sit on you want an area whether it's a gravel pit at the end of the you know going up against the end of the building or um, like a gully or somewhere where condensed water can fl fr flow freely if I can get my words out flow freely without impacting and, and causing puddling on on this ground area because if you're walking to and from and the winter time comes along this produces condensed water the refrigerant pipe work and the fins at the back of this unit gets very cold we live in a very humid climate okay even in the winter time there's lots and lots of moisture in the air so when it's extracting energy from the air lots of particles and, and water droplets end up producing on the back of these units and when that produces it becomes cold the thermostats and everything on the thermistors and the control of the heat pump end up recognizing when it starts to get cold so then it'll go into like a quick reverse cycle where it'll spend a minute or two just to melt off that ice and that water then drains away beneath the unit through the condensed pipe and, and then dedicated to an area where it doesn't impact on the ground if you've got this at minus two outside and it's flooded out or not flooded out but you've got lots of water puddling or pooling in an area on a concrete floor or, or a patio then you do run the risk of uh, a slip hazard and that can be very very dangerous but luckily we've managed to overcome quite a few situations here on this property nothing's ever straightforward we do have to come up with solutions all of the time um, and we, you know we've with a, we've come up with a solution that works for both the homeowner and for the installation so just to point out on this particular um, situation so with the pre plumb cylinders you can have up to two dedicated zones you can put more on but what you probably need to consider is either a larger low loss header or that you split the system adequately so that you don't end up you know one ends up drawing more energy than the other for example um, and on this low loss header and I've just exposed it a bit here is that we've got certain points here that we attach to um, now you have uh, a flow coming in from this diverter valve which comes up and serves into this low loss header then you've got your kind of first port off which goes to your first zone which is running from this pump here and this then will distribute off to the first zone you can have that ground floor or first floor now dependent on the situation so for example we've had this and i've spoke about this on another video that um you may have a first floor that's got radiators in, for example, and a ground floor that's got underfloor heating. And what we would tend to do is actually dedicate the, the first zone, whether it's upstairs or downstairs, to this first zone. And the reason being is that there's already a dedicated pump to serve that first zone. And that means then when you're looking to serve the second zone, if you've got an underfloor heating system in that already has a circulating pump to it, you don't necessarily then need to add a second pump from the second zone for this system um, because you've already got one there so one it saves a bit of time for installation two it saves a bit of money because you don't need to add in that extra pump to serve because you've already got adequate enough uh, flow rates coming through from the other pump itself um, so this low loss header then you've got a second port down now these come as um you know they're they're already kind of capped off as such so they've got a soldered end to it you need to cut these off to then open it up for the circuit to serve for that second zone and then we've got another two pots here so one down low will be for the return on the second zone and then your final return comes down on the bottom for the first zone um, and then that will you know basically give you your two zones that you require the reason why there's only two zones is there's only two zone points on the FTC which is the, the computer that basically does all the job I'll quickly show you the internals of that and what I mean so this is the brains of the outfit this is where you know a lot of your control and you know everything you need to implement comes into play now I've said that you get two zones to go in and what these zones 
when you pick them up from a, from a, a source, so for example, you know, if you've got a wiring center for an underfloor heating system or a controller or thermostat controlling the radiator zone, whatever you bring back to the board, I would either would need to come from the volt free connection on the thermostat or you know, you can put it for a contactor and then it goes in at 230 and comes out at 12 volts or whatever. So it's volt free. Uh, in one, usually, or is always your zone one. In six will be your second zone. And we've still just got a little bit to finish off uh, just to get that second zone up and running. Um, and then also you have these outs across the top here. Uh, one of them will be your zone two is out three and we'll go into this in more detail in another video and then you've got out 13 which would be zone one um originally this sits up at the top out two um when it's just a single zone situation so there's a lot of stuff going on here we've got um this is your signal cable so this basically once we're calling for heat for any reason whether it be heating or hot water that goes back to this the um and that's hardwired back into the heat pump itself and it will also power um, the brown actually gives you s1 gives you the power to to get this pcb up and running and then we've also got here is our immersion point so um, this will be con connected to that few spur up there um, this will be in the on position when that's on um, it doesn't mean and we keep that switch on all of the time it doesn't mean that the immersion is constantly on because this relay will bring it in and up, you know, on and off as and when it needs to, whether that's for Legionella or whether you need to put it into say like an emergency mode if the heat pump was out of operation, for example. Um, so the contact of that, that would be live all of the time. That would be, um, that would be kind of dead as it were until it calls for heat and wants to respond then that will flick this relay on and give you the immersion heat that you need. <laughs> So that concludes really what we're here for today. Um, we've managed to get the uh, everything wired up and ready to go. The heat pump is on and working, as well as the hot water system. So, you know, they've got plenty of hot water to crack on. We've still got to finish some bathrooms, still got to get some underfloor heating thermostats up and running. We'll probably come here just before the winter um, hits, just to make sure that, you know, everything's toasty. All the settings are just completely right for the homeowners. And so they stay toasty and warm in those winter months thank you for watching if you like this video hit the like button subscribe to the channel hit that bell notification for up and coming episodes where we'll discuss more on the heat pump front some of the situations that we're going to be facing whether we're on a self build whether we're on a new build uh, whether we're on a renovation um you know certain developments we've got a lot of stuff coming up a lot of work coming up so we're going to just show you some of the things that we have to face day to day and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one